Hello everyone, my name is Hamed Ekhtiari. I'm delighted to be a part of this dream team of speakers talking about potential for endophenotypes to be used for developing different treatments for addiction medicine. And I'm gonna say that I really like fMRI drug curie activity and this is my uh, endophenotype of choice. And I have seven reasons for that. I'm gonna give you briefly some ideas about those seven reasons I really like fMRI drug curie activity. If you take a look in clinicaltrials.gov, how many trials that we have in addiction that they have neuroimaging as an outcome measure? Do you have an estimate? How many trials should we have with uh, neuroimaging? Addiction, neuroimaging, outcome measure in clinical trial? We have 409 trials up to something like two weeks ago that we did the systematic review that are using uh, neuroimaging markers uh, in, in addiction. And if I want to kind of divide those trials to based on the, the outcome measures that they are using, the neuroimaging outcome measures that are using in terms of scale, modality, paradigm, task, category, I can say that as you can imagine, fMRI is, is uh, the dominant uh, measure that people are using. But meanwhile, in, in fMRI, task-based fMRI and then among task-based fMRI, Curie activity is the most uh, frequent paradigm that people, task category that people are using, which is I mean, showing that this, this specific kind of measure is probably the most frequent uh, neuroimaging marker that we are already using in, in the field of addiction. The second issue that, I, that makes me like fMRI drug Curie activity is about robustness and replicability. We have uh, recently showed in a recent publication that when we have a, a discovery sample and then we, we define a specific kind of uh, ROI or a specific cluster with a specific behavior, here we have been discussing about specific dynamic, temporal dynamic behavior. And if we have replication samples with a slightly different clinical kind of context, even different, different drugs of choice, uh, we can have this almost the same response in, in those, those replication samples. And that robustness and replicability is, is something that those who work with fMRI drug QIT, they, they agree that that is a, an important part of the, that specific biomarker, that specific marker. And then there is a question in terms of reliability. How is the reliability of what we are measuring? That is the third reason that I like fMRI drug creativity. We have shown that we can have a reasonable uh, reliability, specifically in some areas like inferior gyros. There are areas that they have really low reliability because they habituate fast to, to response to drug cues, but there are areas that they kind of have a constant uh, response to drug cues, which is, which is really good. And you know that fMRI kind of reliability is a, a crisis in fMRI studies, especially when you want to do pre-post studies in intervention developments. The fourth factor is availability of different instruments in this book. Uh, like many other labs, we developed a, a sets of drug cues specifically for MET users and opioid users. And we validated those kind of those drug cues and we published those drug cues and these kind of instruments. And even their fMRI tasks are publicly available. And this is the kind of the behavior that other labs are doing. So that we have instruments available that people can use across the world and they're publicly available. The third, the fifth issue that, that makes me interested to fMRI drug cure activity is having all those major circuits that are important for us in drug addiction in terms of executive circuits, salient circuits, self-directed circuits, memory, habit, gain, loss, all those things can get engaged with fMRI drug cure activity. So that is something that people have shown before. And we know that that is a, another important aspect of that specific uh, paradigm, which gives us activations or engagement in many different areas. The sixth factor would be we can have specific interventions for based on using those drug cues. So we can develop a specific cognitive or behavioral or uh, even neuromodulatory interventions, trying to modulate these cue-based uh, reactivities. We have recently uh, 
we are working on a new paradigm that is combining curiosity activity with memory consolidation and future visual thinking. So there are potentials to use draw cues as a main core for developing intervention. This is something that people are, are doing in different studies. Even what we have in uh, neuromodulatory interventions with TMS, most of the trials, they have some cue exposures before their treatment protocol, even those kind of the portable that it has recently received FDA approval has that specific curie activity part. Uh, we are developing a, another specific curie activity uh, engagement and, and modulation uh, using fMRI and TES. So that is a kind of a paradigm that could also be used for developing interventions to modulate that neural target engagement that we are expecting in fMRI drug curie activity. And the last reason is about the level of evidence that we have from the fMRI drug cure activity. Up to end of 2020, we have over 357 studies with something like close to 16,000 participants in fMRI drug cure activity studies that are published so far. And if I want to kind of show you the distribution of these studies across the time and also across different drugs, this is the distribution that you can see. So it is something that has been used quite frequently over the time. And if I want to show you the number of, of studies that people try to measure the effect of a specific intervention, whether it's a pharmacological intervention or behavioral intervention. So you can see that there are multiple studies that people show that we can have, uh, we can use fMRI drug security as, as an outcome measure for, for, uh, for treatment development. Even if I want to use the best framework for categorizing different biomarkers that people developed uh, in fMRI drug cure activity, I can show you that there are multiple studies showing that we have potentials for response biomarkers, severity, prognostic, predictive monitoring of susceptibility uh, <clears throat> evidence. So those are biomarkers from, from, uh, for fMRI drug cure activity. We have recently started to think about, okay, this is a really good paradigm, how we can increase the quality of what, pe what people are doing in this field. So we developed a consensus uh, statement and a Delphi study trying to bring in lots of experts together and see how we can develop a methodological checklist for that. That methodological checklist has been recently accepted in Nature Protocols and will be out in, in the next uh, weeks, hopefully. Uh, the, the copy is available right now in Metal Archive, so you can see that the checklist. So we provided a, a detailed list of items that should be reported in a transparent way in fMRI drug curative studies to increase transparency and applicability uh, of what people are doing in this field. But in a kind of systematic review on previous publications in the field, we realized that there are many of those factors that are not being reported clearly and transparently in, in previous studies. And that is what we are recommending people right now to reuse this checklist to make sure that they are reporting the technical details that are important for uh, replications of the studies that we have. And that would definitely increase the quality of what is happening in the field. What will be the next steps to increase the fMRI drug critic and get it to a level that we are expecting for FDA approval, that is another discussion that we can have today, but I, uh, I'm gonna kind of give time to other speakers to discuss about their, their biomarkers of interest, and then we can go back and discuss about the next steps. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.